As we scroll from the superior to the inferior section, this is the thoracic cavity, right ventricle, and this is left ventricle, and this is the suprahepatic part of IVC, and this is thoracic aorta, and this is esophagus. We are scrolling superiorly, and we are seeing that this suprahepatic part of IVC is opening into the right atrium. So this is the right atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle, with this hypodense, slightly less enhancing, uh, because in the lumen we have contrast this is left ventricle lumen and this is the interventricular septum and when we are scrolling downward we are seeing that on right side this large organ is coming which is the liver and uh, here the part of esophagus is continuing into this organ which is filled with fluid and air so this is stomach and uh, depending upon the amount of fluid which has been taken by the patient just before the scan it can have variable appearances and then just posterior to this uh, fluid filled stomach we have this uh, organ which is spleen so this is spleen and then this is liver and in this section this is abdominal aorta and this part of uh, abdomen this is the diaphragm so this is the right hemidiaphragm this is the left hemidiaphragm and we can compare that the two hemidiaphragms are normal there is no lipoma that is fat containing lesion in the hemidiaphragm which can happen there is no evidence of any defect in the hemidiaphragm also and uh, this is the y-shaped organ which is called as the right adrenal and on the other side this is another y-shaped organ on left side which is the left adrenal so the adrenal gland size we can compare with that of the adjacent diaphragmatic crust in an overview and uh, we need not to remember the size as such this is the medial limb of right adrenal this is the lateral limb of right adrenal gland we can zoom it out this is the medial limb this is the lateral limb and this is the body of right adrenal similarly on the left side we can see that this is the medial limb this is the lateral limb and this is the body and we can compare the size of the adrenal gland with the adjacent hemidiaphragm or the diaphragmatic crust normally the size of adrenal gland limbs or the body is smaller or just comparable otherwise if suppose there is a focal lesion like adrenal adenoma or in patient with cs lungs there can be adrenal metastasis also or in a patient of pheochromocytoma or some fat containing lesion in adrenal which can be myelolipoma there can be a lesion which will be seen focally involving some part of adrenal gland otherwise sometimes in hematoma like in a patient coming with trauma or in a patient who have some disseminated tb there can be granulomatous involvement of adrenal glands also the glands will be diffusely enlarged and we then at that time on comparing it with the adjacent diaphragmatic crust we can say that the adrenal glands are enlarged and thereafter we can measure the size and put it in a particular criteria so the right adrenal gland is just superior to the right kidney which i am showing with my pointer so this is the right kidney but the left adrenal gland is not exactly superior it is slightly antero superior to the superior pole of right kid left kidney yeah and one point i need to tell you is that suppose if a patient has uh, renal agenesis on right side or on left side embryologically even in that case the adrenal will be on their normal position because the embryological origin of adrenal gland is different from that of the renal so even if renal tissue is absent embryologically and renal agenesis is there still the adrenal glands will be there in their correct position slightly inferiorly which is known as the fallen adrenal sign but still yeah they will be present so this is spleen this is liver and this uh, piriform shaped structure that is on the inferior part of the liver this is gallbladder actually although for gallbladder evaluation the modality of choice is ultrasound similarly for adenexa that is the ovarian evaluation the modality of choice is ultrasound only because many of the stones in gallbladder usually 80 percent of them are radiolucent and they will not be picked up on ct so it is better to get ultrasound done or correlation done with ultrasound for gallbladder and uh, then as we are scrolling we can see that just adjacent to 
spleen there is some rounded area which has same morphology just like that of spleen so they can be found adjacent to any pole of spleen or usually they are at the splenic hilum these are known as splenunculus so this has to be mentioned in the report to avoid any confusion and uh, sometimes the liver may be having an appearance and uh, the left lobe might be coursing towards and encircling some part of spleen here so that is known as the sliver of liver which is a normal variant and then when we are scrolling downward downward we are seeing that this area is there which is uh, having a feathery kind of appearance and uh, yeah these lobulations are giving it a feathery kind of appearance and it is reaching till the splenic hilum so this is pancreas and this is a tail of pancreas and we can scroll and we can trace it this is the body of pancreas and just anterior to the confluence of the splenic vein with the superior mesenteric vein to form portal vein we are seeing the neck of pancreas so this is an important landmark the neck of pancreas is just anterior to the confluence of the splenic vein with the superior mesenteric vein to form portal vein so yeah this is the neck and on the left side of neck this part is the body and on the right side of the neck we are seeing that this is the head of pancreas and on the inferior side there is a wedge shaped or pyramidal projection of the head only which is known as the uncinate process so here the pancreas is normal perfectly normal otherwise in pancreatitis it might become bulky diffusely or involving a particular part or it might have intrapancreatic and or peripancreatic fluid collections also and uh, in the peripancreatic region this hypodense area is fat actually around the kidneys this hypodense area is fat actually and uh, this is the skin surface and below that this hypodense area is subcutaneous fat only so you can see that normally the fat is so much clear it is so much dark and it has uniform attenuation of around minus 40 or 50 so normally the fat looks like this but suppose if there would be some inflammation the fat will not be that clean and there will be some linear linear or irregular type strands of soft tissue like this like this so that is known as fat stranding which is a mark of inflammation any kind of inflammation so if there would be pancreatitis the pancreas would become large bulky there might be some peripancreatic fluid collection intrapancreatic collections also and the surrounding fat the peripancreatic fat will become hazy and it will show fat stranding which is a sign of inflammation and uh, which is not seen in this case and when we are scrolling it downward this is the in infrahepatic ivc that is inferior vena cava this is the abdominal aorta and when we are scrolling it further downward we are seeing that the abdominal aorta will bifurcate into right and left common iliac arteries and similarly the ivc will also give two things so yeah this structure which is going towards the left side is the left common iliac vein yeah this is the left common iliac vein left common iliac vein so yeah this area this area is left common iliac vein because of its course it looks like this and uh, this area is the right common iliac vein and uh, again they further divide to form the external iliac vein and external iliac artery that goes like this to form common femoral artery and common femoral vein which goes into thigh we can follow these vessels yeah let's follow these vessels so the common femoral artery and common femoral vein which is just the continuation of external iliac artery and external iliac vein only they goes into the uh, thigh and when we are going backward backward we are seeing that posteriorly yeah these vessels are the internal iliac vessels internal iliac artery and vein which will go behind it it will supply the pelvic structures like uterus or prostate or some part of uh, other pelvic organs so yeah again going backward uh, i will be showing few more structures to you these are the rectus abdominis muscle in between sometimes they can be divarication of recti and there would be some focal bulge from this region and sometimes it can be defect per se and there would be herniation of bowel loops or some other structures through the defects also so 
these are the rectus abdominis muscle these are the lateral abdominal wall muscles which are external oblique internal oblique and the transversus abdominis muscle and uh, then these are the psoas major muscles which lie on the adjacent side of the lumbar vertebra and as we go down these are the psoas muscle these are the iliacus muscle on the inner side of the iliac bone and what lies on the outer side these are the gluteus muscles actually so as i am scrolling downward i am seeing that the psoas muscle and the iliacus muscle they will group together to form ilio psoas which is a common site for psoas abscess and we should look for these areas and uh, on the outer aspect of these iliac bones we are seeing that these are the gluteus muscles these are the gluteus muscles only and uh, this is rectum and uh, since this is urinary bladder which is fluid filled structure urine filled structure and on the inferior aspect this is prostate because it is a male patient otherwise just behind the urinary bladder we would be finding uterus in a female patient and this is the rectum and surrounding the rectum this is puborectalis muscle or simply say you can just remember levator and eye muscles group of muscles or pelvic floor muscles and this is the obturator internus muscle and this fossa which contains fat only this is the ischiorectal fossa and uh, it is such a clear fossa containing fat only but suppose the patient would be having some anal canal abscess or some pelvic abscess then or some fistula then it would might be showing some fat stranding or some collection here so anteriorly we are seeing that uh, this is a part of penis this is a male patient and then this is the right scrotal sac and this is the left scrotal sac so yeah this is the basic anatomy and uh, using an another scan i would be showing you few more things like uh, the segments of liver which are very important so basically this is the hepatic intrahepatic ivc which has given the middle hepatic vein left hepatic vein and the right hepatic vein so the middle hepatic vein will first of all divide the liver into the right part and the left lobe and uh, here in this patient the patient is having tuberculosis so we are finding perihepatic fluid as a part of ascites only and uh, in this patient perisplenic fluid is also there this is stomach and uh, all around the abdominal organs fluid is there that is generalized ascites is there because the patient is having tuberculosis and when we see lymph node lymph node have a characteristic appearance they will come and they will go when you scroll the images they will be absent in the superior mu section then they will come here and when you scroll it trace it further downward they will be seen and then they will vanish they will not continue in any other structure but on the other hand the bowel loops they will be followed the vessels they will be followed but the peculiar thing about lymph nodes and the mark of identification is that uh, see look at this area at my pointer they are not here then they will come and come 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 they will go so the lymph nodes will come and go this can be used to identify them and uh, this patient is having these are the bowel loops these are the bowel loops which uh, some of the bowel loops are distended with fluid inside the lumen like this and these are the collapsed bowel loops and then when we are scrolling downward again at this point these are the lymph nodes because here they are present and then they are gone then the so coronal images you have to locate the portal vein entering into the liver the portal vein is formed by the union of the splenic vein splenic vein which goes uh, towards the spleen yeah so this is the splenic vein splenic vein splenic vein and uh, this was the yeah this was the part of the superior mesenteric vein so the superior mesenteric vein has uh, confluence with the splenic vein to form the portal vein and the level at which the portal vein enters into the liver we have to stop at that level and then in the mid clavicular line you have to measure the maximum craniocaudal size of the liver so that is 13.6 in this case so it liver is not enlarged then in the coronal sections only you have to measure the maximum craniocaudal size of spleen the wherever the maximum size is possible for spleen in the craniocaudal span and then to measure the kidneys we have to use the sagittal sections because the long axis can be measured maximally in the sagittal section so yeah this is the right kidney why we can say because liver is here and uh, this is the 
kidney and we are not able to see stomach here so this is the right kidney only take the maximum size like this and left kidney why because heart is seen small part of liver is seen only and uh, we can see that yeah this is the stomach which is here so this is small part of liver left lobe of liver this is spleen this is heart this is stomach and therefore this is left kidney without even correlation you can judge from the sagittal scan only so this is uh, the maximum size of the left kidney you can tell this is the abdominal aorta then you can see that from the abdominal aorta the first branch that is coming out is the celiac artery and thereafter after this celiac artery we are seeing that superior mesenteric artery is coming out and superior mesenteric artery is coming and going down like this so here we can see that superior mesenteric artery is coming out and going like this but sometimes if the angle is very narrow and the artery instead of going like this or it goes just like this then there might be compression of the second part of duodenum and proximal to that the stomach might be dilated or distended and this is the case of that becomes superior mesenteric artery syndrome which is a compression syndrome and secondly uh, just like for sma i have told you the importance of the sagittal section similarly for celiac artery there is importance of the sagittal section why because sometimes the crust of diaphragm might compress the celiac artery from the top for example there might be compression at the ostea because of the diaphragmatic crust which will be seen as a focal narrowing so in that scenario there may be median arcuate ligament syndrome or dunbar syndrome which can lead to pain in abdomen when the patient eats food because the blood supply to the organs get decreased because the celiac artery gives the left gastric artery splenic artery and the common hepatic arteries usually so these are few things that uh, i had to show in the abdominal anatomy and uh, in the coronal sections again initially when you are the beginner then you like to locate the ileocecal junction on the coronal section because in the coronal section you can see that this is the part of ascending colon and here something at the side where i am pointing this is the part of ileum which is thickened and it is going and it is opening into the cecum so this is the ileocecal junction and you like to see it like this on the coronal sections in the initial phase of your residency so this was the ileum which is thickened you can compare the other bowel loops which have thin walls but this is the ileum terminal ileum which has thickened bowel loops and when we trace it trace it trace it it is going upward upward and yes it has opened into the ileocecal junction normally the ileocecal junction should lie at the level of ileic crest yeah it is almost at that level suppose if it lies here like very much above from the ileo, uh, ileic crest level then it is said to be pulled up ileocecal junction and then in that case even the angulation of ileocecal junction will change and uh, the terminal ileum will show a hanging kind of appearance like uh, gooseneck kind of deformity all those signs need to be mentioned in a patient suffering from ileocecal tuberculosis yes yeah, so that's it for now and in further sections we will deal with further anatomy of abdominal organs this is just the brief introduction